Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. My name is Peter Ettinger. I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Bioenergy Devco. We learn a little bit more about our company uh, later on with a couple of shameless plugs because we're excited to be part of the Maryland uh, Organics Infrastructure or, or Maryland Organics and Recycling Infrastructure uh, with a plant that we're building in Jessup, Maryland. Uh, but today uh, now is an opportunity to learn from our peers, not only about the new waste diversion law that is coming into effect in 2023, and the requirements that it has of all of us, whether you are in a healthcare world, whether you're at a stadium, uh, whether you're just simply uh, creating organic waste, more than two tons uh, per uh, week starting out, and then it'll go at the end of 23 uh, down to one ton per week. Uh, what's really exciting is, the, is our audience uh, um, as well as our speakers. And I think this is an, a chance to learn from our peers uh, about how we as individual uh, companies and organizations can uh, comply with this new law, but do it so in such a way uh, that is not only supportive of our operational goals and objectives, but our sustainability goals and objectives. And that's what's key. And that's why I'm excited if we to have you meet a few of our uh, key panelists today, Matt uh, Steinman from Dickerson College, um, which is an incredible place who's been really working uh, leading the fight in terms of composting around uh, small uh, compost projects and larger AD projects. Uh, Zach, Zach Hetrick uh, at Reduction in Motion. I think what I'm excited about what they do is really how do we, how do we help clients reach and exceed sustainability goals. Uh, Christine is from Republic Services and uh, has had a long history in working with clients in term, uh, in helping them reach goals and objectives. The challenge uh, becomes, I think at very least, that many people look at this as waste. You know, what Republic has done is said, well, what's the opportunity? How do we manage that in, in, in a bigger and better way? And we have Keith Lasoya from Waste uh, Neutral. Uh, you know, again, it's how do you, you know, there as an advisory group, whether it be a combination of, of uh, building plans, but really not only knowing how to build the plan for around recycling, but how to execute against them. So we'll have an opportunity after their presentations at the end of our uh, webinar uh, to ask them everything and anything about how do they, uh, their insights on how to implement uh, smart organic recycling programs. So uh, what are a couple of our topics? Uh, Maryland, interestingly enough, and uh, is leading the waste diversion business uh, throughout the United States. We always thought it was California. We're gonna call Jessup, Maryland, and uh, Jessup, Maryland, the California of the East Coast. Um, we uh, recently passed a law in the end of 21. It's now working on in individual statutes and specifics that talks about how you manage your waste in a more affordable, more smart way. And it centers around organic recycling. The idea being that can you take, if you produce more than two tons now you know, by 2023 of organics, how do you manage those organics in a way that is economically and environmentally smart? We'll talk a lot about that today um, in, 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 with advice from our panel on how do we think about that law, how do we comply with that law, but how do we do so in a way that's operationally smart? Uh, land application is a big issue here in Maryland, and there are a number of standards. A nutrient management uh, plan was uh, passed, or a healthy soils plan uh, was passed in around 200, 200 2019, sorry, um, and is it being implemented as we, as we speak. So the idea of land application, how do we take organics and land apply it, now are being looked at by a number of different regulatory agencies. So we now need to understand how do you best manage the materials that come out of the anaerobic process or how you manage materials that come out of the composting process as well. And there's a big demand for renewable energy. Maryland's RPS, or Renewable Portfolio Standard, has really uh, set down a 30% uh, renewable energy usage uh, by 2020, and now moving towards 50% in 2030. And what we talk about in the anaerobic digestion field is a three-legged stool. There's certainly solar, there's certainly going to be wind, uh, but in that three-legged stool, what role does anaerobic digestion play, not only in economics, but again, in environmental management? 
you know, why are we concerned about this, uh, uh, this, this issue and why are we asked everybody to participate today? Uh, really, this, we're seeing a zero waste revolution. Uh, people are looking at the challenges caused by incineration uh, and the pollution caused by incineration and saying no. Uh, people are looking at landfills and landfill uh, gas exposure, GHG, GHG emitting landfills becoming a problem. And if you think about it, we live in a much more confined space. It wasn't that long ago when I first moved to Maryland that between Baltimore and um, Washington was Meriwether Post. And we always thought of that as being farm country. You know, oh my gosh, don't go out to Meriwether. If you run out of gas, you'll never come back. Well, now we live right next to each other. Everybody is living closer and closer together. So the idea of a landfill being expanded is really a thing of the past. Uh, really the idea of a landfill being recapped and, and reused is becoming very, very expensive. So there is a move to zero waste. And I would say that consumers are also looking at the drive uh, to how to minimize uh, the amount of organics going to these kinds of vehicles. That's why anaerobic digestion is a renewable landfill with great capacity makes sense. So sustainability and greenhouse gas reduction, clearly an item that consumers and, and, and community members are looking towards. Uh, I would suggest that one of the number one issues, and there's going to be a gubernatorial um, a town hall this Thursday, uh, talking about climate, uh, about climate and what people will do of those, what those candidates are declaring themselves willing to do to manage greenhouse gas reduction. If they think there are votes there, there's clearly a consumer and community movement around it. And that demand for renewable energy, how do we do that in an efficient and effective way? The Europeans have been um, supportive of, of compressed natural gas, renewable natural gas as a way to manage methane. In fact, with billions of dollars of incentives uh, being offered to vehicle use. And if we think about the kind of materials that we produce uh, from anaerobic digestion, it's the precursor to hydrogen. And hydrogen will be one of the newer, better, cleaner green soils, uh, green uh, energy products. And then we have soils. Soils, uh, the regenerative agriculture business, how do we make sure that we manage uh, highway, uh, uh, our state highways without pesticides? How do we make sure our, our waterways are protected? How do we make sure that soils um, and clean water are a thing that is a priority item? So uh, a little bit about us, uh, we have been doing this for 25 years. We have built, operate, finance, and manage anaerobic digesters throughout the world. Uh, that is our claim to fame. We look at it not only as a piece of technology and a very advanced piece of technology in which we own a number of patents over 20 uh, throughout the world, uh, but we look at it as a way to solve challenges. How do we uh, ensure uh, that industry can be profitable, but at the same time, the environment is maintained uh, in the way that we all expect? Uh, we own a number one market share in Italy and France, um, and I think the most creative thing that we do, or one of the more incredible things that we do, is our laboratories. So the concept of uh, being able to be a great chef, of being able to understand the microbial mix as it relates uh, to a number of different products coming into your anaerobic digester. So knowing that you have pizza from Domino's or you have uh, institutional waste from coming or institutional organics coming from Nats Park. How do you put those two things together and make sure that your microbes are happy, your microbes are healthy, and that you can ensure and guarantee performance of the plant? And we say that with ensure as an I, uh, with an I, uh, because we actually do have performance uh, 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 insurance around our performance as, as well. Think of lab testing uh, as a crockpot. You know, when we actually put these waste portfolios together or profiles together, uh, anybody can put stuff in a crockpot, but it takes somebody to be, uh, who understands spices to be a great chef. And what our lab people understand is what are those spices? How do we naturally ferment and naturally create renewable natural gas and healthy soils. So we're excited actually uh, to be here in Jessup, Maryland. Uh, this is an old photo. Uh, we're actually in the middle of commissioning this plant, uh, which will be fully operational in June of this year. We invite everybody uh, to come and take a tour. Uh, please send us a, a note. We're happy to host. Uh, this is, location is key to us. 
Um, this sits at what's known as the Maryland Food Center Authority. Maryland Food Center Authority manages uh, produce distribution through the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, it's similar to Hunts Point Market or Philadelphia Produce Markets. And it is a center point where organizations like Del Monte on one side, Coastal Sunbelt on another, Pappas Tomatoes, varieties of organizations from very small to very large are doing things like fresh cut, cut salads or salsas. But as a result of that, there is a great or fair amount of waste, you know, uh, waste that typically would go to a landfill. But now with the new waste diversion law, people are saying, well, if I have to be within 30 miles of a waste, an organic recycling facility, where do I take this? Where is their capacity? And it's really exciting to be working with groups like Republic who are looking at this and saying, okay, how do we manage this in an environmentally sound manner? We'll produce 295,000 MMBTUs. It's an, it's, which means that we are making a substantial impact on greenhouse gases, roughly 30,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And that's about 56 times the size of Central Park are about uh, the size of Jessup, Maryland. Uh, full operation, as I mentioned, uh, is, is working uh, by the Q2, close of Q2 2022. And we have depackaging. And from an institutional perspective, what I'm talking about here is we can take a certain amount of material, orga predominantly organic material, but we can depackage. Uh, we can uh, take the uh, tomato crates and depackage those. We can uh, identify the forks and some of the spoons and things like that, and take that as a level of contamination and make sure that we actually have refracted organics uh, for use in the anaerobic digester. So we are really designed for institutional use as well. We like Del Monte, we like Coastal Sunbelt, but we also know that whether you're in a mall, a stadium, um, a large healthcare institution, that the pre-consumer and post-consumer is a big challenge. And we would love to be able to work with you to how to meet those challenges, um, simply not only in picking up material, but working with the speakers today in terms of how to create an overall program where anaerobic digestion serves a role in providing a solution uh, to many of your challenges. Uh, for those of you who don't know anaerobic digestion, it's a cow's stomach on an industrialized scale. It works similarly to a cow. We take in organic materials, uh, separated organics, packaged food, animal manures, depending on our location. And an anaerobic digestion facility uh, is completely enclosed. So there is no exposure to air. There is no uh, wastewater goes in through that is cleaned and goes through your uh, sewer system. We create a digestate that actually can be directly land applied based on uh, a recent law that was passed uh, qualifying digestate as being similar to or affected, uh, similar to or equally as effective as a compost. So when you think of anaerobic digestion, again, think of 115,000 tons of completely enclosed capacity, managing those things, those challenges that are important to a community. So things like um, odors, thing because our, our facilities have scrubbers and biofilters, things like water, what do I do with it? We actually take in most of the water back into the facility and recycle it. And the rest is actually in the standard of how, for Howard County. And as we mentioned, there is this soil amendment that we actually produce called digestate. We need to think of a better name. If anybody has an idea, idea on that, please throw it through the chat or give it, send us an email. Um, but th that can be land applied directly or created into a compost. And then again, renewable energy, the drive to something that is green, the drive to something that comes full life cycle from an organic substance. So that's what it, an AD is about. And I mentioned uh, before, as we're, we're looking at this, it's a multifaceted climate issue. You know, it is a sustainable infrastructure. You'll have 30, 115,000 tons of material that can be produced, sent to this facility for the next 30 plus years. Um, this, if you think about it, um, is, is on a five acre plot is an incredible use, incredible management of land by, while being able to deliver on all three of these issues by in terms of clean water. We have our own wastewater treatment plant at the facility as well. We think of that as being an incredibly important aspect of what we do and work closely with Howard County to make sure that that material can be recycled or sent to the sewer system. And this whole idea of anaerobic digestion, it's good to note that in Europe, for example, uh, it's the only continent that has a reduction in methane exposure. And I would say that I would like to at least suggest that the 9,000 systems in uh, Germany alone 
is not, is not a plays at very least a small part in reducing methane from the atmosphere. And it's interesting to note that in Europe, just one country has 9,000 anaerobic digesters. Here we have less than 500 that are operating and most of the additional facilities are in wastewater treatment plants. So we see a change, particularly in the Biden administration and particularly uh, actually in a, in a um, uh, it, it, the recycling committee, uh, committee in the House and Senate, who are now uh, both Republicans and Democrats, it is waste management is a non-denominational, not non-advocacy position. We have to figure out what to do with it. We need to figure out how to manage it. And we uh, all uh, can come up with a number of great solutions. A uh, couple ways we go do this, and we look forward to talking with everybody on this call at some point. Please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, the first step is assessment. What do you have? How do you distribute it or dispose of it today? We work with our partners on the call uh, to do that first early feasibility study. Together, then we look at cost. How do we look at your per ton cost? How do we look at contract term? How do we look at uh, long-term challenges associated with both tip fee, uh, uh, the uh, hauling uh, challenges of carbon, and we work towards an, an agreement working with the folks on the phone, our folks in our panel, uh, to come up with a program that makes sense uh, for you. And that is very personalized and specific. And there's education and training that goes along with this. We were just talking with, a, with an organization and that was one of their keys. They said, look, from our distribution centers, we get it, but we would like to figure out that uh, we send uh, this same message to our uh, consumers. And now we're talking with them uh, and their partners on how to do a simple recycling and training program uh, for consumers as well. So it's not just the, the, the haul, it's not just the tip, it's not just the compost, it's how do we work together to achieve your goal and objective using anaerobic digestion as a key element in the solution. Um, exciting to talk to Matt. Uh, Matt is, uh, I, I love Dickinson College. Uh, they really made a, a, a great commitment to composting, a great commitment to gathering organic waste, uh, a great commitment to doing this in such a way that we're also talking about jobs of the future with many students. How do we look at regenerative agriculture? How do we use our materials uh, in a positive way? And I think it's important to note that what we do in the AD world lives hand in hand with composting. And we'll talk more about that as well. But first, Matt, take it away. Thank you, Peter. And thanks so much for having me, everyone. I'm really glad to be here on the panel. So um, I am from the Dickinson College Farm. I'm the uh, Livestock and Energy Project Manager. And uh, I will go to the next slide, please. So uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, you know, one of the most important crops we grow at the farm is uh, young people who are really engaging uh, leaders of the future. Um, and uh, we are both, both involved in sustainable agriculture and uh, sustainable waste management and renewable energy. Next slide, please. Uh, the college farm is both an educational program and a working farm. Uh, so we do serve the liberal arts college uh, at Dickinson College. Uh, through a variety of disciplines, but we're also here for students to get some life experience, uh, get their hands dirty and blow off some steam. Uh, and then we return that effort back to the campus by uh, feeding the community. Um, we plant 10 acres of certified organic produce every year. Uh, we also have uh, grass-fed beef and lamb on about 40 acres of pasture. Uh, and we're a place where students come to work, both for pay or volunteer hours, or also for academic credit for internships. Uh, and then um, a lot of our food goes back to the cafeteria, as well as through a local farmer's market and a program. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, here we are from space. Uh, we're about 90 acres. Um, and uh, we'll see more of that in a second. So uh, right now, most of our food waste goes to composting. Um, and uh, that's the major thrust, but uh, we are also involved. That's fine. Next slide. Uh, in anaerobic digestion. So. Uh, our major feedstock is um, food waste from the college cafeteria. And when it comes to the farm, it looks like this. It is a pre-ground material, ground to about uh, half to a quarter of an inch in size, particle size. Uh, and we receive it in these 10 gallon uh, Rubbermaid type trash cans. Um, our students, when they come to the farm, they bring the food waste and they dump it into our loader tractor. Uh, and then one of our permanent staff will take that tractor and uh, put it on the compost box. Um, 
So we have been collecting this material since uh, before 2008, but in 2008, we started doing a kind of a mechanized type system. Next, next slide, please. Uh, in the dining hall at uh, Dickinson, we have what's called a pulper extractor machine, and this is in the dish room. Uh, so all of the pre and post consumer waste goes through the Hobart machine. Uh, what it is essentially uh, that you can't see here is like a big channel uh, with a conveyor going over it. And um, uh, the staff there are using a spray, you know, spray nozzles on their on their hose to uh, spray off plates. And um, all, all the waste is going into this uh, channel of water. And that water is recycled through the machine. Uh, uh, the waste is ground down to, again, about a quarter inch in size. And the, most of the liquid is spun out of it. So by the time it gets to the farm, it kind of looks like chicken salad. Uh, or potato salad, depending on what was being ground up. And uh, it's got a moisture content of about 80% um, moisture, 20% solids. Um, they are grinding both pre and post consumer waste. So like everything that the chefs uh, peel, uh, trimmings from apples and potatoes and, and lettuces, uh, as well as uh, food they don't serve, like if they have uh, too much product, uh, that all gets ground up and pulped. Uh, and then of course, everything that comes off the, the student's plates uh, is wild. Um, and uh, we get pretty clean waste with a minimum of uh, plastics in there. There's a magnet in the Hobart machine to uh, remove uh, metals. Um, and uh, this machine has been in operation since 2008. Uh, and uh, it's had a couple of overhauls in that time. Uh, we do have a staff member on campus who's really familiar with maintenance of the machine. But I would say overall, it's been really reliable. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what it looks like on the loading dock of the dining hall. Uh, that's one day's worth of uh, food waste production. And uh, we keep it in these bins with uh, lids on them to keep uh, squirrels and, and rats from getting into there. Um, and uh, one of the big features here is that not only are they being more sustainable, but uh, they've actually cut their trash bill in half. So between the food waste composting and uh, a little bit more effort on uh, other recycling, uh, the dining hall has gone from one dumpster, excuse me, from two dumpster halls a day to one dumpster hall a day. So, that actually enabled them to remove one dumpster from their loading dock and uh, free up some space, as well as cut down their trash bill quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right now we're collecting about 750 to 1,000 pounds per day from the dining hall. Uh, and uh, a lot of that labor is actually done by our students. So we have students who work at the farm and uh, we have this pickup truck that lives on campus. So uh, it's a six mile drive. When they come out for a farm shift, they, one of the drivers will bring the truck and pick up compost this is part of their job. Uh, and we also have that as a weekend shift as well. So for the most part, uh, the compost is hauled to the farm by student staff as part of their regular work shift. Uh, if a student is not available, then one of our adult staff does need to go in and pick it up. So uh, that is the, the labor component uh, that's in excess of the student work. Um, we hauled about 137 tons in uh, 2019. And in, in addition to cutting down the trash bills and providing more nutrients for the college farm, it's also a carbon offset. So it fe features into the uh, carbon calculations of the campus and the college farm is actually a net carbon sink because of the compost process. Next slide. Uh, we have a lift gate on that truck. Uh, and so these are toter type uh, food waste uh, containers. This is actually at Weiss Market, a, a grocery store in Carlisle, but we have the same type of compost containers for uh, the um, residence halls on campus. So. Uh, students can opt in to putting their food waste in a, in a bin outside of the residence hall if they choose to. Uh, we do find that the uh, residence hall compost is the most contaminated with plastic because it's not well monitored, whereas the dining hall uh, dish room stuff is all kind of managed by uh, regular staff. Next slide, please. Oh, I should say that lift gate that was pictured there is also really handy for, uh, we, we collect uh, brewer's grain from local breweries. We collect about a ton per week from one uh, local brewery. And that lift gate is just super great for lifting up those heavy 200 pound uh, trash cans. So again, it comes to the farm, we dump it into the loader. Uh, next slide. Uh, from there, one of our uh, staff takes over and we will uh, mix one scoop of food waste with typically uh, two scoops of leaves or uh, wood chips. And the leaves come from our municipality. We're an extra dump site for them. We also get uh, free wood chips from the tree services. Um, and we bury that material in a windrow. Next slide. Uh, once it's uh, in the windrow, we, we accumulate a windrow over about a, a course of a month, then we start turning uh, and uh, adding the, um, the leaves keeps uh, things like crows uh, and the dog on the farm out of the food waste for the most part. Uh, we are out in a rural area, so um, a little less concerned about vermin than we would be if we were right in town. Um, 
But uh, once it's in the wind row, then we start to turn it. This is a, a turning machine attached to our uh, 65 horsepower tractor. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, and the turning, it helps to both homogenize the material and uh, break up large particles, put the outside on the inside. Uh, we can aerate the compost piles, which stimulates the microbial decomposition. Uh, and um, just generally makes a real nice product with a minimum amount of labor. We can turn a compost pile with that turner in about, um, usually about five to seven minutes if everything's going well. Next slide. Uh, the, the compost when it's done is land applied. So uh, we have, uh, as I said, 90 acres of farm. So that's a lot of land that needs uh, fertilizer. Uh, so we're getting both nutrients and uh, microbial benefit, as well as uh, a soil enhancing uh, organic matter, adding to our, our soil organic matter uh, on the farm that way. Uh, in addition, we have been working on AD systems for over 10 years. Uh, we have an owner-built um, small-scale AD system. This is uh, our plug flow anaerobic digester that we built in the greenhouse. Uh, it processes about uh, three bins of the food waste per week, uh, and that is actually enough to make gas for cooking on the farm. So we, we make uh, cooking fuel, and uh, we use that for uh, – next slide. Uh, the, the biogas made in that uh, digester will uh, fill up these gas bags on a daily basis. Uh, one of those gas bags is enough fuel to cook um, kind of full bore at about uh, two to three hours. Uh, so we do both um, residential cooking and we have a commercial kitchen on the farm where we make pickles, uh, canned goods like tomato sauce, et cetera. Uh, so that's what we've been doing so far. But as I said, we're only consuming about three uh, uh, bins of food waste per week with this system. So in the future, next slide, we're uh, transitioning to a commercial scale anaerobic digester. Uh, we're partnering with our neighbors who have a dairy farm with 150 dairy cattle and building, next slide, uh, a small-scale digester like this, much smaller than what they're doing there in Jessup, Maryland. Uh, but uh, same concept, uh, converting the uh, food waste and cow manure into biogas, and which ours will be made into electricity for uh, backfeeding the grid and powering up the two farms. All right, I think I'm over time, so I'm going to hand it back to the uh, moderator. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. And uh, everybody put together your questions uh, for Matt and the rest of the panel. We look forward to taking all of them. Next, we have uh, Zach Hetrick from Reduction in Motion. Zach, I think it's uh, um, it runs an amazing group that really talks about um, how to design and reach sustainability goals for individual clients. So uh, without further ado, Zach, please take it away. Thank you, Peter, and I'm happy to be here on the panel as well. Welcome to everyone out there on the line. I am the Director of New Business Development at Reduction in Motion, and we are a team um, out of Maryland um, who works with organizations to help them with waste min minimization and sustainability programs. We've been doing it for about 20 years, and I'll share a little bit more about us at the end. But my main goal today is to speak to the institutions on the line and give you some tips on how to start or improve your organics collection efforts inside. So Sarah, if you could help me with the next slide. Um, before I go any further though, I wanna talk about the challenge. And I think it was alluded to a little bit already uh, today by Peter, um, but when it comes to institutions, food waste and organics as a whole uh, is not your predominant waste stream, which means we really have to take a different type of approach to diverting organics uh, from the different areas throughout your institution um, versus um, the larger food producers where organics is their primary waste stream. So keeping that in mind, um, I've outlined a few tips here to help us today. So if you go to the next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, I'll go through each of these here in a second, but the goal here is to get your people involved and to empower them to be part of the solution. Without the buy-in from the folks at the front line, it's going to be hard to reach your goals. Uh, so ultimately, that's uh, where these tips are driven from. So we'll go to the first one. And so the first tip is to audit before you start. So we want to figure out what type of organics you have, where it's located, how it's being generated, who's generating it, and why. And it's important to remember that as an institution, you might have different uh, workspaces, different functions within your facility, and it might take a number of different waste audits uh, strategically placed and timed uh, to really truly understand the waste profile of all your different functions. Here we have 
to pictures from waste audits that we've conducted. These are obviously very technical waste audits that we undertook to really dive deep into the waste profile of different clients. It, never, it doesn't have to be, uh, your audit doesn't always have to be this involved. It could be a simple visual audit, depending on the size and scope of your facility. But it's important to first start with an audit to truly understand what waste you have and where it's coming from so you know where to start. Go to the next slide for me, Sarah, please. And with that data then, it's all about picking the right targets. I would say that the key here in starting an organics diversion program for an institution is to focus on 100% quality versus 100% quantity. So instead of trying to capture all the organic waste and material you identify in your audit, um, focus on the targets that will result in the highest quality material um, to begin your program and build from there, which means that you may have different strategies for pre and post consumer organics. I know this was a term that Matt mentioned as well, so I'll just define it for those who might not understand. Pre-consumer um, organics is organic waste that's generated prior to being consumed by a consumer and post is there then after. So pre-consumer would be like in your kitchen, whereas post-consumer would be actually in your dining facility. Um, and so you might need different strategies to collect that. The other thing to keep in mind here is food versus compostable. So understanding what other compostable material will be accepted um, by say the digester or other hauler that's taken it from you. And just keeping that in mind when you're identifying what will be accepted in your compost bin. Uh, we always recommend first targeting areas and items that impact the numbers, but with minimal operational disruption. So often that means starting in your kitchens or dining areas. One of the easiest ones we've found over the year is the coffee grinds. Uh, so um, just picking those targets to get you started and build from there. And lastly, when it comes to getting started and picking where to start, if you're, well, you should make sure that your organics diversion strategy is part of a larger waste and recycling diversion strategy. If you do not have a larger waste and recycling diversion strategy as an institution, then I don't recommend starting with composting. So if you're interested in starting a composting today, but don't particularly have a recycling program or other waste uh, minimization strategies, I recommend including it all in one. Um, so you're taking a cohesive approach to waste separation as a whole. As you can see there with the bottom slide, that's at an institution and that is actually a post-consumer location, but collecting the compost is part of their larger waste separation messaging. You'll go to the next slide for me, please, Sarah. When it boils down to it, we wanna make sure that we are aligning the waste flow with the workflow. And this is gonna be key to success. And sometimes this is as easy as putting out a new bin, but other times it's really uh, requires working with the people on the front line, understanding how they do their job and designing uh, the separation strategy around that. So here on the left, this gentleman, uh, he works in a prep station where everything he's generating there is uh, organic material. So he has a it was as easy as lining his big gray bin with a new bag for compost and everything that he tosses goes in there. On the right, that's similar to the tray return line um, that Matt was showing where um, she is uh, scraping plates. And so she has some food waste, but she also has recycling. So here the recycling bin is the larger one and the food waste is a smaller bin. Um, and it's about, again, thinking about how your staff does their job and how can we design waste flow around it. Next slide, please, there. So once you've got it set up and running, you've had a little success under your belt. You, it, when it comes to recycling and especially organics recycling, it is not a set it and forget it proposition. You need to keep engaging with your staff and you need to keep educating them, finding opportunities for improvement. Here on the left, we have um, some data from ongoing audits we do for a client that shows missed opportunity in their municipal solid waste stream. So you can see across the different buildings how they're doing, and the brown represents the mist uh, compost that could compostable material that could be collected. And from, we use that data to really you know look at uh, improving the containers, education, signage, and so on and so forth as we look to grow the program. And on the right, it's one of our staff members uh, doing a twice annual education with a client of ours and their kitchen staff. So next slide, please, Sarah. And so my last tip today is to work upstream. 
So once you have that mature program uh, or semi-mature program, uh, you're collecting organic waste from pre and post consumer locations. The more work you do upstream to identify waste before it's generated, the more successful your organics program will be. So here we have a client that we work for to just, you know, part of the waste audit that we did, identify all the different materials they have um, and begin to categorize them, inventory them, figure out who's purchasing them, how and why. So we can work up, up upstream to, again, prevent waste before it starts or at least transition to organic um, compostable material that allows for easier separation of that organic. Next slide, please, Sarah. So those are my tips for the day. I'll just share a little bit about us. So Reduction of Motion, we have been around since 2002. Then for the past 20 years or so, we've been helping companies make sustainability possible. Um, our specialty is in working with you on site with best practices, education, and that on-site support. Um, and we've worked a lot in hospitals, higher education, and um, uh, stadiums and event venues. We can do anything from providing someone on site um, to help you with managing the program um, or project-based support, whether you need that audit to get you started or you're, you've had a compost new program for a while and need to jumpstart it or uh, figure out ways to improve it, we can come in and help you find uh, new ways for improvement. If you go to the next slide, Sarah, give you a sense for what we do on site. So again, our team spends a lot of time working with our clients directly on site to manage their programs from managing the specific initiatives we have underway, like composting efforts, uh, to training their staff, to resolving maybe the issues they have with servicing, um, or just overall engaging their staff and employees in uh, reaching their environmental goals. And so I think that's my time for this morning. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Zach, very, very much. You know, clearly education training uh, is a key element to working with our clients, recognizing the importance of recycling and the importance of organics recycling, particularly as it relates to you know, not only composting, but anaerobic digestion, finding a, a great way and a manageable way to really use this sort of material in a productive way. So really appreciate it. Um, next up, um, yeah, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> next up. So, you know, it's a, it's a great lead in uh, Zach's presentation. And again, please start thinking of your questions. Um, how do you think in a, in a dual way? You know, how do you think about how do you manage a process of organic recycling that's good for business and while being good for the, the planet. We think anaerobic digestion coupled with composting particularly is, is an incredibly impactful opportunity here in the state of Maryland and, and beyond. And particularly for institutions who are being driven by community members and participants who are saying, are looking for um, declarative statements uh, and a real walk the walk, talk the talk statements by our institutional uh, clients and how they manage uh, both organics, but also greenhouse gas exposure. And that's the issue of how do you, for an institution, you manage costs. You can't do this um, and willy nilly go into something and say, my God, you know, AD or composting is the silver bullet. And if you only spend a whole ton of money, um, you'd, you'd be good too. You know, we need to, as a team in the people on this uh, call, particularly look at the challenges of managing uh, and stabilizing the disposal costs in an environmentally smart way. Uh, risk mitigation clearly uh, is, is a key, uh, but you can't uh, do this without maximizing operational reliability. There's nobody on the call from an institution side or, or any of our participants who would um, risk working with a client and saying, well, you know, we're gonna pick up material every other day or every third day, unless it made complete operational sense. You can't leave composters sitting around. You can't leave containers sitting around. Uh, and at the same time, um, there's increased risks faced by institutions and others um, in terms of people asking, what are you doing with those organics? How are you managing it? Um, making sure that we don't have environmental violations. And in fact, we're meeting and exceeding um, the more important, uh, the laws uh, and statutes associated with waste diversion. I would say that, you know, this group of folks who are speaking represent incredible partners and, you know, a hauler here is as is, is well, very key to our, uh, how you manage that waste, you know, knowing that you have reliability, knowing that you have a name uh, uh, that can support uh, your operational goals. And one of the reasons we're excited to have Republic with us and being working with us uh, moving forward. Um, 
business values are, are clear. Um, not only do you meet and exceed the requirements of the, law, of the law, but it's a great place to go and work. People like having this kind of a culture. People in, feel, you know, from the, the uh, from the scholastic side or the collegiate side, or you know, from uh, fo folks that we're talking about at Dickinson, uh, all the way down to the execution. It uh, being able to manage uh, materials in this way uh, reflects uh, an important culture. Um, we are also seeing consumers worldwide looking at sustainability. Uh, we're also looking at a demand for sustainable goods. I think this is the key element uh, that 71% uh, rise of people who are looking for materials or organizations that have sustainability as part of their, their credo is, is key. And then this is happening worldwide, whether we're looking at the Ukrainian issue or the challenges there, how do we rely how do we find energy independence and energy independence from what others consider waste, uh, but creating a valuable byproduct uh, and being able to go and manage that on a local basis? And I think this local uh, sustainability uh, is truly uh, key. And this is going to be something that more and more people are looking at, more and more uh, politicians are looking at, uh, ensuring that they commit to protecting nature and natural systems. So with that, uh, Christine Meckett, McKett is our friend from Republic Services. And I think Republic has done an incredible job uh, in terms of working with its clients and trying to help them uh, really develop an organics recycling program. And I'm happy to hear uh, Christine's words of advice, direction on how we can all uh, meet, in, uh, meet and exceed our goals in, in this area. Thank you, Peter. Um, good morning. I am the sales manager for Republic Services in the Baltimore market. And just to get a sense of what Republic Services is, traditionally, we would have been associated as a recycling and trash hauling company. And recently, over the last several years, we've really discovered that we want to be an environmental services company. We've listened to our customers, we understand legislation, and we've evolving to be the one source for all businesses for their environmental services. In Baltimore, in the Baltimore market, we have about 10,000 commercial customers. We do not service residential customers in this market. Republic Services is a national company and we have 30,000 employees um, and as we are evolving to make sure in, in every market that we are partnering with companies like Bioenergy, Devco, Devco Bioenergy, um, to make sure that we're offering to our customers everything that they need for their sustainability goals and the respondents in this case to legislation that is more and more being put in place um, by states, uh, counties across the country. Um, what we really are targeting is a large generator. So our, what we're providing would be for generators that require a compactor or a roll off. Uh, we, we are really not going to targeting the smaller generators in a commercial route. Um, we do work with the state of Maryland. We have the state of Maryland contract. We work with a lot of hospitals. Uh, we work with uh, casinos, so those are just some of the kinds of customers, and there's been um, a lot of, from our customers, a large desire to work with food waste. Um, and for those that haven't expressed that interest, then we're educating them. With uh, large generators, and I'll use a specific example that we're looking at together with Bioenergy Devco, um, is at the prisons, not far from they're in Jessup, Maryland as well. We have that contract and in the prisons, there's always a dedicated food service compactor. Uh, so to use that as an example of how, what we do with a potential customer that has large volume of food waste, we schedule that compactor to come to our transfer station. We dump it. We, with a representative from Bioenergy Devco, look at the waste, identify what within the waste stream is considered contamination, um, and then work with the customer to say, okay, this is where is it generated? What's the point of generation? And then 
developing um, education and so forth to get that segregated. And then to determine the volume that remains so that we can come up with appropriate hauling schedule and then also a smaller container for the waste that should be pulled from that waste stream. Um, one thing about Maryland, and there's this is very, we've known this for a long time, but I think the public's beginning to know this more. Maryland is a primarily export state uh, for waste. Um, in this Baltimore area, you think of all the large haulers and the small haulers. We either have transfer stations, as Republic does, and waste management, or you have a contract with a transfer station. Primarily, commercial and industrial waste in Maryland is either hauled to Virginia or hauled to Pennsylvania. And when you think about the, what a large carbon footprint that is, uh, when you're talking about hauling over long distances, and the cost, because we know where fuel is going. So it, when we talk about, and, and Peter was just talking about having local infrastructure and solutions that are local here uh, in, in markets and are diverting waste, um, it's critical. So when we talk to a customer, we have some customers, like for instance, any of the agencies under the state of Maryland, they're going to be fully compliant uh, with this legislation and really want to come on board. But we have other customers who maybe are just more less oriented towards sustainability. Well, there is another reason that this is very important. It's much more economical. When you think about the how inefficient it is for a compactor, that's what we're talking about here, to be picked up by the hauler, brought to a transfer station, empty and then reloaded into long haul trailers to go either to Pennsylvania or Virginia. Um, it, it's extremely um, wasteful and, and it has a, as I said, a huge carbon footprint um, that we would be reducing by bringing whatever we can bring out of that waste stream. And Republic is 100% behind this. We, in some parts of the country, do have composting facilities. We have material recovery facilities, but this is that next level. And I think this is a critical piece to be um, sustainability goals and to be environmentally responsible. And I would love to work with any of the um, and members that are on this call, and um, we're very excited to work with Bioenergy Devco. We've just recently executed a contract, and we're very excited. So I'm open to questions once the last uh, next couple of speakers and anybody that would be interested in um, beginning to have their waste audited and go to Bioenergy Devco. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. We're equally excited to have you as a as a client, and you have really uh, helped uh, lead our education and training efforts with larger organizations, uh, large, uh, medium, and small organizations. So we're excited to have you as part of our uh, our family, and we we're excited to be part of the Republic family as well. And we're up next with Keith Lasoya. I. Um, I love the idea of, of the name of waste neutral. We're oftentimes fond of saying that, uh, you know, all of us on this this call are really uh, we're the folks who clean up after the parade. You know, we don't really care what it looks like or what was put there on the parade route. We just want to make sure it's clean, managed, and in an environmentally smart way. Uh, waste neutral's got a great history, a, a great uh, uh, program. Looking forward to hearing from Keith. So, Keith, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning and learn a little bit more about this sector of the waste industry. I always like this slide because it was one of the first questions that we used to ask people when, uh, you know, we would ask them, you know, where does all this waste go? And it was somewhat of a riddle. Um, but that was, you know, over a decade ago. And since then, we've made great strides with educating people and also institutions like yours um, committing to uh, separating their waste streams. And everybody knows you got the solid waste stream and recycling waste stream, the co-mingled stuff that came up first. But now, you know, compost was that third rail that we needed to find a solution to. 
So that's what I'm going to explain more about our beginnings and what we're doing now. Next. So when we got started, you know, I always, you know, had to define ourselves, you know, because we are a hauler, we are in the waste industry. But what, you know, really made sense to us is that rather than being your define ourselves as trash man, we are resource recovery people because that's exactly what we do. We take what what was what used to be considered a you know disposable waste stream that goes to landfills and incinerators, we recover it and we send it to be processed into a new product that would be compost for soil augmentation. Next. So when we started, I always you know, I, I laugh when I think back at it because, you know, sustainability was actually a relatively new word. And, you know, we have come a long way since then, obviously, um, but there's still a little bit of a challenge when, you know, when discussing with institutions, you know, how we can separate this waste stream, uh, food waste, and recycle it as well. Um, so, you know, we took, a, uh, you know, I always like pioneers take the arrows and settlers settle land. We took a lot of arrows, but uh, one of the silver linings that came out of starting so early is that we were able to assist all of these large institutions, hospital, educational, and uh, commercial properties, as long as smaller restaurants, with, you know, those early adopters, um, with achieving their goals of sustainability and being able to compost their food waste. Next. So as we know, the food waste uh, comp comprises a great deal of the solid waste that uh, has historically gone to landfills and incineration. But as we also know, compost has been going on since the beginning of time. We just happen to get away from it um, with you know, non-sustainable infrastructure goals and sending things uh, to landfills and incineration. But now it's going the other direction. And we're glad, even though it took a, a little bit too long for my taste, I'm really glad that uh, more infrastructure is being built to assist with the goals of our customer sustainability uh, goals. Next. So Zach was mentioning, of, of, uh, discuss a lot about what goes on on the back end. And I really like this slide because, you know, it shows just a sample of a lot of those um, customers that we service and we have serviced um, for well over 10 years now, those ones that got started early. Um, there's a great many more customers that are, aren't on this list and, and a lot of them are coming on board as a result of that legislation that was passed. And I'm sure, you know, one of the reasons why many of you are on this call today, but like in addition to this, we, you know, the chip, all the Chipotle's, uh, Chick-fil-A's and Starbucks in the area are now coming on board. So a lot of universities and commercial properties, you know, you, you saw Matt's presentation and it's incredible, but a lot of you don't have the resources um, to commit to this sort of operation where you close the loop on site and are able to compost your food waste. Uh, that's where we come in. And uh, my friend from Republic also mentioned that, you know, they're going to be starting off dealing with the larger compactors um, and, and larger dumpsters. But uh, we do the, the smaller uh, container apparatus. You know, we have from 32 gallons all the way up to four cubic yard dumpsters uh, for, for what we consider our, our high volume waste people so that we can take uh, the food scraps if you can't dedicate a dumpster to it. Um, when we go into a facility, uh, we I like to think that we've been to almost every back end there is and we've learned a lot from it over the years. Um, but the first thing that we do is we work with your team, dining facilities, et cetera, uh, to color coordinate the, um, the waste streams uh, so that it becomes very easy muscle memory um, very quickly uh, for your operations to to uh, you know to adapt to it and it's it in one thing that uh, we get feedback from all the time is like wow we thought this would be a process engineering thing that would be very difficult and it's not um, so as Zach alluded to you know with companies like theirs um, you know they show you how to do these and it becomes very easy a lot easier than you would think next so I like this slide because it kind of shows where we 
where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, I always like to think that if uh, New York has the Empire State Building and Paris has the Eiffel Tower, unfortunately, what we have in Baltimore here is Bresco. It's the, it's the big incinerator that you see on 95 when you're driving into town. And every time I drive back by that, I always think, well, we need to get away from this, you know, and certainly landfills, which is probably the worst um, uh, option uh, in order to dispose of waste. So we've done that to an extent over the years, and we um, and now you see the comp these compost facilities grow. Uh, but as a, towards the bottom of the slide, you know, you got two different images there. One on the left is the coal. If you're driving by Baltimore, you see these huge piles of coal, tons and tons of it. And I've always thought, you know, the way we're going, hopefully we'll get there quicker. Um, I hope those huge piles of coals turn to huge piles of compost, a truly uh, great way to transition over from where we've been uh, to where we need to go with recycling. Next. So this slide is important because if there, other than uh, getting past the word sustainability in the very early days, if there's been any challenge, the biggest one has been infrastructure. Over the years, uh, we've had to take our waste uh, to faraway counties and as far as Delaware in order to be composted. Uh, only for a short period of time were we fortunate enough to have a processor in the city of Baltimore. Um, and you know, it's been a, a great challenge. So uh, we take, currently we take all of our compostable waste to the MES Western branch. And quite frankly, for uh, large volume haulers like us, it's the only game in town for many haulers uh, that just specifically compost haulers in the Baltimore DC metro area. That's why we were excited um, as to, as, as uh, DEVCO uh, started developing their processing facility, because with the new bill, with all of the uh, all of the volume that will be coming online in the next few years that needs to be diverted for composting, we definitely need more infrastructure. And a facility like Devco can handle a very large uh, part of that volume that will be coming online. So we're looking uh, to the future, which is very close now, in 2023 to expand our options for where we take all of our, what we call feedstock, because you know basically we're the nitrogen guys. We're the ones that bring, bring the food, food waste to these composting facilities. They mix it with the carbon aspects uh, in order to create their product. Um, but we really appreciate that we, um, when we talk about carbon footprints, as was mentioned earlier, ours has been way too high for our taste, especially with the price of uh, fuel going up. And you know to have a closer facility that, you know, can do, can, can manage the volume that we bring them is welcomed. Next. I always say that every successful business has a labor of love aspect to it. And while there are many, probably my favorite is our compost credit program. When we partner um, with our customers, whether they be small independent schools or large uh, hospitals and uh, universities, uh, they're part of our compost credit program. Many of the universities' schools um, have uh, gardens on their campus, and, and to help close the loop in the psyche, to show a little bit of where, the, you know, to reward the labor the labors that have gone into separating and uh, recycling the food waste, we bring compost back. Uh, we're gonna get very busy here in the next few weeks and on into May, um, delivering compost back to all of our customers to help educate uh, their, their students, their uh, patrons, their, um, you know, the, their uh, employees as to, you know, what exactly is happening with all of this food waste that's uh, being diverted. Um, so we hope that many of you, if this, uh, if you're when you're listening to this today, just so you know that there's a it this program doesn't work without a large educational component and and the compost credit program really helps drive home the educational message and and lets people know wow we we've done a really good thing here. Next. And that's it. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, some of you have questions and I'd love to share with you more how we've helped institutions and uh, like yours uh, develop programs in order to divert this waste stream that you're gonna need to do in the future if you're not doing it already. Thanks.
Hey, thank you, Keith. And for everybody out uh, in the hinterlands, please uh, send in your questions. You know, we'd love to be anything and everything. Uh, we look forward to being as responsive as we humanly can. Um, I have one for uh, each one of you, actually, and we can go from the top down or let's go from bottom up, you know, uh, key, and it's about challenges. You know, what are, uh, when you come to um, a uh, client and who has expressed interest, what are some of the naysaying things that they bring to the, the discussion or what are some of the challenges uh, that you think they have to overcome. Keith, why don't, why don't we start? We'll work backwards from now. Sure. So, you know, the biggest one is, you know, is, you know, looking at, you know, what they're doing now. And a lot, there's a lot of fears there, like with, you know, how are we going to be able to separate this in the back end and in the front end? We've talked uh, before about the pre-consumer and post-consumer aspects of the waste streams. Um, and like Zach had mentioned, we always focus on the pre-consumer first, the prep waste. And we show them how relatively easy it is in order to um, separate uh, their waste streams and get it part of the muscle memory of the staff. The other one is... Um, the infrastructure where to put the equipment as i mentioned before you know like some very high volume producers might not have the ability to dedicate a compactor to this waste stream so we look at you know the options for them based on the different size smaller size uh, containers that we have in order to make that happen and the other one is the nature of the waste. It's food waste. And that was always scary. Like, oh my gosh, how about the rats and everything else? And, and uh, you know, that, that, that come with that type of waste stream. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, when I go to most locations that maybe they don't have a dedicated compactor for it, but they have dumpsters and bins, um, I say, well, what are you doing now? And where does it all go now? Well, it all goes over there. I said, okay, well, all we're doing is making this particular waste stream go over here. Um, so it's not disappearing, it's just being separated and we take it away. I'm also happy to say that all of our trucks are retrofitted with a, a pressure washing system. So when we take away the food waste from the bins, um, we actually pressure wash uh, the bins um, to give them back you know, relatively clean. It's a low power wash. It doesn't do a great job if there's a lot of food scraps in there, um, but but it does help uh, control the odors and some of the issues that, that you may have. Um, those are a few of them, but again, I'm rewarded. I've been rewarded ever since I started this company with uh, with how, how customers have come back to me and say that was a lot easier than we thought it would be. Christine, how about you? You know, we we run into many of the same things. I think our biggest challenge is that decision makers or at the level that they're contracting with us um, want to do it and will embrace it, but it's truly getting down to that point of generation and getting every, you know, a large quantity generator oftentimes uh, is running multiple shifts around the clock and they the workers to really get all the workers to comply is a big challenge it's it, it it's a really you know that is our biggest challenge whether it's in composting a regular commingled recycling any of it and we you know we offer to do training i've had my sales reps go into you know as part of the deal they're going I have teams going in on every shift, so we're actually helping with the training uh, at the point of generation. But that's a very big problem. And the other problem is that um, you know food waste can be is not after a little while it doesn't smell very good and it becomes very obvious. And so those are some of the challenges. Now we do we have uh, some different we have ionic machines that we will put in place that help to minimize odors and odor esters. I mean, so there's, you know, a lot of different options, but it's a challenge. That's where, you know, you find it, you got to really stick with it. And that's where I feel like if my team can really assist them and train their people and, you know, help. And if the drivers, we get the drivers to say, uh, you know, we let them we let them have some contamination and we'll cover it the first couple of times. 
Um, you know, the problem is it gets dumped. We bring it to you by our energy dump code and you say this this load is, is no good. Well, somebody's going to charge us back. It's the same thing that happens with recycling. So we will really try to work with an organization, but those are the, the big challenges. That's great. Thank you, Christine. Zach, what, what about you? What are you thinking? Well, Keith and Christine stole all the good ones. Um, <laughs> so, but I got a couple here. Um, my, I guess uh, you only get to make, you know, first impression once. So if you're, you're if you're really thinking about rolling out this program, um, follow little tips. You know, the prior pl planning prevents poor performance. To really engage your stakeholders, really do the education and engagement with everyone who's going to be affected. Um, do things like he said of assessing your dock and understand how you're going to hold it and understand the points of generation, things that I talked about, like how we're going to collect it, how we're going to transport it. Do all that before you roll it out, because if you just roll out the bins and see how it's going to work, and then you're kind of playing catch up with, you know, education and trying to fix things from there. So, you know, be mindful of that first impression to that frontline staff and taking your time to plan things out and engage them before starting it. Um, so everyone's on board and on board and excited and feels like they've bought in to it before um, you roll it out. And then you're trying to deal with their issues and they would have liked to add this address before you started. Um, I guess that would be my main, my main, uh, my main point. No, this is, this is all very good stuff. And I'm, I'm happy to say that, by the way, this is all being recorded. So anybody who wants to listen again to a number of these uh, words of advice, uh, would be is is uh, is important, Matt. What what about you? I would say I'm going to echo the uh, previous panelists saying, uh, you know, getting buy-in from the staff in the uh, point of collection is super important. And uh, in in this uh, present moment in um, food service, but what we're seeing is uh, a real staffing shortage, uh, just with the pandemic-related uh, labor disruptions. Um, I think it's pretty universal across higher ed, but at least at Dickinson here, uh, they're down like 30 people in the dining hall. Uh, and that that has a huge impact in just performance. And um, so whereas uh, we've always had a steady waste stream, we're, we're seeing some contamination or some uh, kind of oddball things coming our way that's due, I think, in part to volunteers who are help, helping out in the dining hall uh, just to try to help. You know, we're all pitching in to help uh, make ends meet until the staffing crisis is uh, rectified here. Um, but food service, you know, they, they set their budgets kind of on an annual basis, and uh, they really weren't prepared for the um, the labor price increase that you know, went with um, the labor shortage. So, so that's been interesting. But just, you know, getting people to buy in uh, is so important. And I'm really reminded by uh, like Zach's comments that uh, education is it's an ongoing thing. We can't just uh, set it up once and, and forget it, but it's got to be reinvested so. well thank thank you matt um there was a question in the chat about it would we are these services available throughout the eastern shore um we are looking at uh, speaking for bioenergy devco we are looking at an opportunity uh on the eastern shore particularly on the maryland side uh, to combine uh, food waste uh, along with some of the interests we have on the poultry uh, uh, from the poultry world or the protein world, um, we'll keep everybody uh, we'll keep everybody abreast of that. And certainly, we would entertain any discussions. You know, working as well with our panelists um, to figure out bigger, better ways how to manage um, organics on on the shore as well. Let me let me ask one last question to folks, and and Keith, you can start us. Uh, uh, off as well, again, if you don't mind, uh, which is what's the immediate next step for a business to get started? What's the one thing you would ask them? You know, they make you the phone call. They said, yeah, I'm in. What's the one thing you need to know from them? Well, we always start with a very brief uh, site analysis. So, you know, if they're interested in getting started, you know, they invite us out there it really only takes, you know, 20 or 30 minutes that we can have a discussion, get, get, a, get a look to see how they're doing things now, and then come up with ideas on, you know, based on our experience of what would work best for them. We've, you know, again, getting started early had its challenges, but we've developed a lot of case studies over the years that you can apply to most any situation. 
we present those to them and then that makes the conversation the process go so much easier moving forward it's just that first site analysis visit uh, that makes everything uh, get started How about Christine, how about you? What's the first thing you're gonna to do to build an organics business for your customer? Um, well, you know what, Peter, we've been doing this really with you over, uh, with Vinny over the last um, year. Um, we, when we identify when a customer says, hey, I'm in, I'm, I wanna explore this, uh, we redirect that compactor to our BBC transfer station with, that has a big enough floor to actually dump it and for us to look at that material and determine whether it truly makes sense or not. If it's, um, if it's you know, a small portion of food waste, it's not, you know, I might redirect them to waste neutral or we maybe I'll form a partnership, but really to say that we're going to bring you a compactor of food waste, we need to see what's in it. And that's what we what we do. And I mean, there's some coordination effort with that, lining the pickup schedule, having it, it may, BPC may not be the closest uh, transfer station, but it's one that allows us to safely you know, do an audit of the material. And once we've done that, when we, ideally we have the customer with us so they actually see it um you know if they're really want to do it then they will tilt those extra next steps and begin that education process look at the point of generation who do we need to teach is it color-coded bins and you know all the way down what everyone else has talked about but that's what we do we redirect it and do it actually you know because a compact you can't always you don't know exactly what's in it if it's all going as trash it's going as trash, but when we're talking about bringing things out of that waste room, we need to actually visually see it and get a sense of the volume. May I mention one more thing real quick? Sure. Yeah, so something came to mind when when uh, Christine was talking, it's like one of the things that we've experienced over the years is, you know, these initiatives are sometimes driven by students, sometimes driven by the executives, sometimes driven by dining or facilities. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, some of those uh, branches of the institution aren't really made aware of the whole process. So I encourage everyone, if you're uh, thinking about doing this, is to have everybody involved. Nobody likes to be caught with their pants down and um, have everybody, have everybody, all the stakeholders involved so they understand, you know, that this, that you're very interested in this happening and that we, I always say, take the curse off the call. Whenever we meet with them, they have you know certain ideas but we always take the curse off it when we go and visit them and show them how how uh, easy it can be that's great zach how about you what do you think is the one thing you would tell your client i'm upset with keith because he jumped in front of me and that was the one that i was going to say <laughs> stay stakeholder engagement stakeholder engagement stakeholder engagement so if you're interested in uh in starting something um again the keith's point Whoever started the idea, presented the idea, let's determine who needs to be involved right you know, now in this first step um, and then pull everyone together and then reach out to somebody here on the line today so we can talk to you um, through the process, see your site, walk through some of the challenges you might have or, 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 or concerns you ha have and determine where best for you to start is. Peter, could I add, add one more thing that we haven't talked about a lot, but it, it's, sure. it's a big deal. Um, at least in the, the larger quantity generators, this is at, not only is it the right thing to do and it's green and environmentally, it's also much less expensive. So, you know, people are not, yes, there's sustainability goals and they want to be green. But when you're talking about institutions, sometimes, you know, a lot of them, have very you know tight budgets. They're made ahead of time. Things are unexpected. If you can say to them, "Look, I can," you're going to be saving money on your uh, trash and recycling bills by making this eff extra effort. A lot of times, that's motivation. Um, I think it, you have to present all of that picture, and that sometimes gets you know different stakeholders committed. And I think that stakeholder idea is really important, but you know, not everyone has the same 
that is so going in with all the pluses of you know switching to making sure that they're pulling the food waste out of the trash stream. I think that's a, a great comment that um, sustainability doesn't mean you're blowing your budget. You know, sustainability and these two things, and we're very fond of saying economics and ecology need to work together as it relates to waste and, and managing waste, creating it into opportunity. Matt, how about you? What's the one thing you, we tell your, the, the students and your uh, participants? Well, I think just uh, getting them to be excited about closing the loop um, and understanding that they're, they're actually, the waste that they generate is going back to the farm um, and, uh, and then the farm produces food that comes back to them. So getting them to see, uh, you know, kind of like what Keith is doing with the compost coming back. Um, it's not just about the stuff going away, it's actually uh, benefiting um, in, a, in a closed loop system. No, agreed. And, and with that, I wanted to just thank everybody very, very much for being part of this, this program. I can't imagine a, a better group of, of speakers, a better group of committed uh, folks who really understand the balance between uh, how do you drive smart economics, how do you provide smart solutions, and how do you do it in a way that you can quantify your sustainability goals, which is you know, key to groups that range from the Washington Nationals, and yes, I'm a baseball fan, uh, to the local healthcare institutions like a Johns Hopkins or others. Um, I want to thank everybody again. Um, I would welcome any additional questions as they come up. Please do send them to us. This will be on our website. We'll make sure that the uh, presentation is available as well as the recording. And I would also invite everybody to come and see us in Jessup. Um, the facility, as I mentioned, is going to be uh, up, uh, running uh, in our end of second quarter for sure. Um, we're happy to have you there now uh, or between now and then, or you just call us, we'll make sure it happens. And that the goals that we'll be working with in Republic and others, you know, for us is how do we deal with, oh, as everybody has said here, you know, Keith and, and Zach particularly, how do you do a waste assessment? How do you do balance and economic analysis? How do we then allow you to reserve capacity? And it is a capacity driven renewable landfill. Um, and how do we ensure that we're working together uh, with organizations to make sure that that digest aid, which is actually by the, you know, by the state of Maryland is seen as a uh, compost 45 days into the process. How do we add and enhance the existing businesses and how do we build that business? in a way that many, many more people will be looking at compost as a, an incredibly valuable soil amendment and a way to reduce greenhouse gases as well. So thank you, Matt, Zach, Christine, and Keith, and thank you everybody for participating. Um, we look forward to continued conversations. Goodbye now. <laughs>